Hi there, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I want to talk about the two main kinds of toxins that could be jeopardizing your health. The toxins that you're flirting with and the toxins that you're married to. <laughs> and no, no judgment about your loving relationships. This is about literal toxins. And check this out, I learned this one recently. So toxin is really not a correct term when we use it in reference to things in the environment, because toxin, to be precise, is something that's biological in origin. So like I'm in the middle of nowhere, if I got bit in the butt by a snake, <laughs> that venom would be a toxin. But let's say that I had a meal that was high in pesticide residues. Those are actually not toxins, to be precise. So who knew? But I'll use the term anyway, because it's the way we commonly use it. So the toxins that are that we're flirting with are ones that are more transitory. They're ones that enter our bodies and tend to leave rather rapidly. Whereas those we're married to, they've gotten deeply stuck inside of our tissues, our bones, our brain, our organs. And they're both a little different in terms of how you manage them and how you make sense out of those. So when you hear about blanket detox strategies, you got to wonder what is it you're trying to detox, what you're trying to get out. So let's make some sense out of this. The flirty toxins, the ones that move through quickly, are primarily volatile things. So think about plastic derivatives, think about pesticides, and also think about solvents, so cleaning compounds especially. And these are things that are primarily airborne. Actually, the biggest source of toxins overall for our bodies is things that enter through the air. And your home's the biggest source of that. You know, some easy strategies, Adopt a routine that some traditional Asian cultures have done for quite some time, and that's don't wear shoes in the house. I've got some friends that have little racks with different size slippers at the front door, and guests are encouraged to grab a pair of slippers and leave their shoes outside. It's pretty neat because you lower the burden of most toxins in the house, and you make a very, I don't know, almost sacred, set apart type feel to the environment. Lead, especially, is one that we track into our house, and from there it moves into our air and into our bodies, and then it can stay. So minimizing shoes indoors is one big strategy. Also keeping carpets and ducts clean and fabrics clean or minimized. You know, the fewer areas you have carpets, the less stuff that bioaccumulates. And also indoor air filters make a huge difference, especially for your bedroom, because that's where you're spending the most time, that's where you're moving the least, and that's when you're the least able to detoxify effectively. You know, and I like them too because most of them make some white noise. That can be a really good cue for time to get ready for bed. <laughs> we have one that comes on automatically about 9 o'clock. And I swear it's like a Pavlovian response. You know, where you ring the bell and the dog salivates. That thing comes on and I'm all of a sudden thinking, oh, wait, i got to start winding down and slowing down here. So indoor air filters help a ton. Plastic compounds are also big, and these are so common among our consumer products. So things like shower curtains, you know, the new car smell, lots of toys, lots of food containers especially, these are plastic-based. And with plastics, there's always this debate on which chemical is the worst. You know, BPA got a lot of attention recently, but there's a myriad of other chemicals that are probably just as bad that haven't gotten as much attention. And we make the mistake in our policies of saying, oh, okay, so now we know BPA is bad, and now BPA is gone from many products, so it's safe, so it's all got to be fine. And that wouldn't be the most logical approach. It would be more logical to be wary until you have hard data proving otherwise. So plastics in general, really good stuff to minimize and avoid. And thankfully, there's so many good food storage containers now that are glass-based, readily available, work really well. And... You can also heat foods with those. You know, brief aside, I can't, I can't ignore this one. So you're heating food in that, it's okay to microwave. Microwaves are not radiation. I'll talk about that one maybe in a future topic. <laughs> so minimize the plastic all around you. When you do get plastic, here's an easy trick. Let it off gas outdoors for a few days, ideally in sunlight. So the UV rays from the sun they break down many of those volatile compounds and they make them less harmful and less present. So that's a great trick there. Then we have pesticides. So the big source of these, the big two sources would be our diet and then also our home again. 
So in terms of pests and pest sprays, pest treatments, you know, there can be bugs and that can be no good. So I can understand the compelling reasons to, to do that. Um, I've been stung by scorpions in my, in my own bed, minding my own business at night. So pests can be a serious nuisance. But indoors, the amount of times you spray is a strong correlation with the risk of leukemias and lymphomas. Outdoors, the risk does not seem to be as significant. So spraying around the home, probably not a big deal. Spraying in the home can be a problem, however. So really minimizing that is a good way to lower your burden as well. And then we've got our diet. And the big things there are produce and then animal fats. So produce, the types especially that are above ground, so like leaves and berries and plant stems, they have the highest exposure to pesticides as opposed to root portions or areas of plants that are inside of peels, like bananas, for example. So all the things that are up in the air, more or less, and the things that don't have big, thick peels, those are ones you really want to go out of your way to get organic. Otherwise, they do really build up and bioaccumulate. The densest sources are actually peanuts and raisins, as far as some of the big ones for common foods. Uh, coffee is also a very high source of pesticides. If it's something you do enjoy, that's one that's worth going way out of your way to get organic versions of to lower the pesticide burden. And I mentioned animal fats. Well, you know, the animals that we eat, by and large, have to deal with toxins like we do. And one of the bad things about toxins is they build up in our fat. That can be part of weight gain, that can be part of resistant weight loss. But think about this. If you're eating fat from an animal that was exposed to toxins its whole life, you're getting a jump start. You know, you're getting all the stuff that animal had going right into you. A lot of it's going to store as well. So the more fat you have in animal food, the more important it is to have that be organic. And, and even then, I would argue that low fat is probably better for that reason. There have been some studies showing that even organic high fat foods still can have substantial pesticide residues. You know, even if the animal wasn't fed them directly, there's always so much indirect exposure that can't be completely avoided. There's always some that comes about. So lean types can be better. And of course, wild fish being an exception, wild fish, those fats are the best for us. They're the most useful for lowering inflammation and helping our bodies break the cycle of too little anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. So animal fats, organic, minimize, good strategies there for minimizing the pesticide burden. We talked about plastics and pesticides. Those are the main types of flirting toxins. <laughs> How do you know if they're affecting you? You know, there's not perfect measurements. There are some urinary markers that give a gauge of how much your body is processing these things, and they're somewhat in indirect. The best strategy really is being aware of your avoidance and really reducing it, and also speeding your elimination processes. And you can do that by pooping and peeing more, <laughs> staying, staying well hydrated, keeping your bowels real regular, and also sweating. You know, that's such a great thing on a regular basis. Several times a week, it's wonderful to break a really good sweat. And you can do that with hot yoga classes. You can hang out in a dry sauna. Or if you're in the beautiful desert southwest, there's no shortage of ways you can sweat. <laughs> Pretty easy to do. Now we've got the married toxins, the stuff that's deep in your body that's really stuck. And what about all this? Well, so these are primarily metals. These are the byproducts of everything else that your body just can't break down any further. You know, imagine that you're taking large complex molecules and chemicals like say rocks, breaking them into small pieces like dirt. So elements are the lowest place you can reduce things to without a particle accelerator. So the most your body can break things down is to the level of elements. And this is where we think about the toxic metals. Big ones being lead and mercury, other ones being cadmium, arsenic, uh, cesium, thallium, many, many others. But lead and mercury probably make up the bulk, the bulk of these. And what happens is these are things we're directly exposed to or they're byproducts of other toxins. But because they're kind of like good elements, things like magnesium or calcium or zinc, our body can confuse them. And our body can intentionally store these things the same way it would hold on to the good, important elements, namely our essential minerals. So they get bound up in the same places that minerals do, and they get really stuck. They get deeply entrenched inside of our bodies. 
So think about tissue like, for example, cells within your liver. You know, you can get a certain amount of toxins stuck there, and as those cells break down, those types of toxins come back into circulation, and then they end up getting stored again. These things are so sticky, they're so able to get trapped, that we can move them from our stored areas out to circulation and then send them out to our intestinal tract, but the bulk of it's gonna come right back in and get absorbed and get stuck again. So they make the loop over and over again. These, these are measurable. They can be measured by hair, blood, or urine tests. Hair tests are good gauges, but they're not accurate. So what I mean by that is if your hair says you've got no toxins, you've probably got no toxins. If your hair says you've got some toxins, you might have a little or a lot. And if your hair says you've got a lot of toxins, you might have a little or a lot. It's hard to say how much. Blood tests are really good for your exposure in the last couple days. And that's about it. They don't show the whole long-term burden. There are red blood cell tests, which are specialized. Those are a little bit better, but they are nuanced. For example, arsenic really gets stuck in the red blood cells, whereas mercury does not. So they're a little bit different in how they're interpreted. Then we've got urine tests. And random urine tests are not super useful for long-term exposure because we're worried about the stuff that your body can't get rid of. And the urine is showing what you're getting rid of. So urine tests that are just collected randomly for one sample or for a whole day, they're just showing what's passing through, not so much what's deeply stuck. So provoked urine tests, those show what come out with your body getting a dose of something that would push stuff out. And the rationale there is that something should come out, we'd be expected to, but if a small dose that's appropriate, that's based upon your weight of a detoxing compound causes a whole lot of stuff to come out, that means you've got a lot of stuff left behind. It means there's more waste present. And those types of toxins are so relevant because by themselves they're dangerous, but it goes beyond that. They also affect how well we manage the flirty toxins, the ones that are just passing through, the ones we're not really stuck with or not really tied to or committed to. So the more metals we have in our body, the less well we can detoxify plastics or solvents or pesticides. So they can often be the hairball clogging the drain of our body's cleaning out systems. So good, good to screen and very treatable. They can be safely taken out. And there are methods to that, some of which are more effective, some of which are too aggressive, but they can be safely eliminated and brought out. And that's so wonderful because that allows your body to regenerate better. And that means that you can have better brain function. And that's also wonderful so that you can have a higher metabolic rate. You can burn fat easier. And you can have greater mental clarity and better energy and better recovery from exercise, all by getting those types of things out of the body. So think about the toxins that you flirt with and the toxins that you're married to. And have strategies so there's less flirting and also have strategies so that the stuff that's stuck inside of you is stuff that you want inside of you, the good minerals, and not the bad elements. <laughs> Thanks so much. Dr. Christensen signing off.